All right. What's in the question? So fourth question says, uh, hi, Dave. Thanks for the great videos and information. I'm a 51-year-old male in good shape, but would like to be excellent. Right on. As well as optimize vitality and longevity. I run three times per week and do dumbbells and body weight exercises three times per week, but I'm lacking the zip I used to have and the belly fat is becoming more and more difficult to keep off. I currently take 50 milligrams of DHEA orally, recently tested numbers, uh, uh, so like tea total is 440 nanograms per deciliter, bioavailable tea uh, looks like 1. Point, is that 1.43 nanograms per deciliter, free tea 7.6 nanograms per deciliter, uh, that doesn't sound right, uh, SHBG, um, 50 nanogram, uh, nanomoles per milliliter, excuse me, TSH 1.8. Uh, anyway, general questions. Could HCG be beneficial to reasonably increase, optimize these numbers? And he puts in parentheses, in lieu of replacement therapy and to maintain testicular function, uh, can HCG be used safely long-term? And then have you seen any clinical benefit from daily DHA only? Thanks, Kai. Okay, so uh, at 51 years old, uh, these numbers are not unusual, first of all. And you say, okay, well, again, that's why I like his, his beginning. Um, as I say, it's normal to get sick and die one day. So just because these are normal doesn't mean they're necessarily good or optimal. Yes. Um, and again, you don't treat numbers, so I should back up and say, you know, again, um, drawing attention to he doesn't feel like he used to feel and he's having trouble despite doing all the right things. Uh, keeping the belly fat off um, so he didn't have the zip he used to have um, so this is not unusual to see at 51 so and the numbers support yeah uh, likely low T diagnosis is appropriate here but he asks, could ACG be beneficial to increase or optimize the numbers it could be to optimize the numbers yes but remember we don't treat numbers and what I'm getting at is what I've seen many times before is we'll raise the numbers, even in a 51-year-old, more often in a 30-something-year-old, but the effect isn't there clinically. Uh, sometimes initially patients will say, oh, I, I, see, I see the difference in someone who might have, say, abused uh, anabolics or, or I hate to say abused uh, SSRIs, but maybe have been on SSRIs since their 14 or whatever, and so the HPA axis hasn't developed properly, or for whatever reason, their T is low, and at say 28, we get them on HCG, it might work for a couple of years even, and we'll see that in the numbers, and we'll see it clinically, but then we'll only see it in the numbers, and clinically, they, they come back and say, Doc, I know, I see the numbers, I'm just, I just don't feel good anymore. And a 51-year-old, we're more likely than ever to see numbers change, although you get too old, and even the numbers don't change, the testicles are done, they're saying no. You can bug us all you want, we're not gonna work, but sometimes you'll see the numbers uh, come up a little bit, but the patient says, yeah, but I don't feel any different, doc. So likely this is not a good way to go with replacement or, or, or for treatment to improve the symptoms of which he's complaining, but uh, doesn't he mention uh, maintaining uh, testicular function for, uh, I thought he mentioned fertility. For fertility, absolutely, it can still help because you don't need that much localized production of testosterone, in other words, in the testicles, intertesticular testosterone, to keep the Sartoli cells functioning, therefore to keep fertility. Um, but in lieu of replacement therapy, I would say, if he's referring to testosterone replacement therapy, you know, odds are against you. It's worth a try if you want it, 51, I've never seen it work. The oldest I've seen it uh, work is roughly 39 in one of the patients who actually, even after 39, tried to gut it out for a little bit longer uh, before he finally succumbed to TRT. But, um, you know, you could always try because probability and possibility aren't the same, but highly unlikely. Uh, can HCG be used safely long-term? Absolutely. Uh, we've seen it used uh, uh, long-term. It is a homologue of luteinizing hormones. So uh, we, we call the receptor LH, uh, LHCG in the brain and elsewhere. So that hormone is presumably produced in, you know, to some degree uh, off TRT till the day we die, even if it's not that much and it's not helping to produce so much uh, testosterone. So um, long-term safety has not been demonstrated to be an issue. 
How long would you be on HCG? I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the guys to ask are, are the ones in academia like Dr. Lipschultz at Baylor who've been doing this for many, many, many years. And I don't even know if they've aggregated this data, but again, we, we there's no study to support that it would be an issue long term. Um, have you seen clinical benefit from daily DHEA only? Yes, I have. Uh, the adrenal glands will step up to the plate oftentimes when the testicles have, have faded and you'll see elevated DHEA levels and some of that can turn into, can be converted into testosterone. It can also turn into other things that you might not necessarily want like excess estrogen. And that's why I always say, look, if you're going to do this, why, if you want to fly from LA to San Francisco, why go via New York uh, and risks, you know, the, Delay. whatever comes with an indirect yeah. route. Yeah. Whatever possibilities. Uh, but I have seen it work both naturally when patients come in and, and um, uh, you'll see their DHEA off the charts because that's, that's all they got left and, and their adrenals are responding. Um, but supplemental DHEA, just like with endogenously produced DHEA, runs the risk of conversion to a hormone that you don't want. So again, not, not my first choice, but it, it, it could work. And when you say clinical benefit, uh, if we're talking about getting it to convert to testosterone, I just finished that thought. But there are other benefits to just having DHEA. You can see when you uh, when you supplement with DHEA, sometimes you'll see uh, we call it backfilling of uh, the corticosteroids. So you can see some decrease in inflammation. Um, you know, it's an arbiter of the immune system. Arguably, you might see some increased energy. Uh, but again, more indirectly than directly, which I think is the the point of, the, of Kai's question. So. Uh, again, without having all the information needed in general, uh, at 51, uh, my first recommendation would probably be to go directly to TRT only because, not only, but mainly because that's where you're most likely to see benefit without rolling the dice. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. All right, Doc, what else we got? Thank goodness for my iPhone. I know. Uh, question number five says, hi, I watch your videos with Dr. Rand and I was hoping you could answer a question. I'm a 54 year old man and I'm considering a 10 week testosterone cycle of test and anthe. A lot of older people this week. I know. Good. Nice. Well, this, this is obviously great. more appropriate. Uh, I shouldn't say it, but just, you know, more likely to be TRT candidates at mm -hmm. that age than, mm -hmm. than not. Um, it is the first cycle I would ever be doing. My natural testosterone is 378. I assume that's nanograms per deciliter. My question, at my age, will my natural testosterone level return after the cycle? Answer, yes. <laughs> but depending upon how long you're on the so-called cycle and uh, at what age you come off. So if at 54 you decide to do this for three months, then more than likely you'll return to something very, very close to what you started at. In the same way, a female who's taking, for example, birth control pills will bounce back to her original levels of hormones uh, as long as she didn't start taking birth control when she's 15. And as long as we're talking about that window of, say, I don't know, anywhere from, say, 26 to, to, um, to 35. Uh, Anyway, you're, the point is your endogenous production will come back online. It may not be sufficient. It certainly isn't based upon at least this one assay, uh, numbers-wise, you know, uh, saying that you know total testosterone is 378 nanograms per deciliter. But you should come back to something close to that if you just did this, like I say, for a short period, like three months. Uh, I would be using tamoxifen for a month for post-cycle therapy. Is tamoxifen better than Clomid in my situation? Again, guys, I'm giving general advice, not specific advice. In general, uh, Clomid's not my favorite because of what I mentioned earlier, it's an isomer of, of two different substances, zuclomiphene and, and inclomiphene, and it looks like the zuclomiphene part of Clomid is what tends to give some individual side effects. Not all people get the side effects, but inclomiphene, uh, seems to do a better job. It seems to act like a SERM and a SARM. So my choice would be either tamoxifen or inclomiphene, but not clomid, uh, just to avoid the potential for side effects. And then he says, uh, my concern is my age and whether this one cycle or two would force me to go on testosterone replacement therapy for life, or if I use a smaller amount like 250 milligrams per week 
and cycle pro uh, properly, will this be okay? Kind of a loaded one, the, this, this last part, <clears throat> in that uh, I guess the first question I'd ask is why, why do you want to go back to where you started? Oh, it sounds know. like to me your natural testosterone is not doing what you would like it to do like it did when you were, say, 25. Uh, so I'm not sure what the intention is to return to that level. And I mean, It's going to suck. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I can guess based upon my experience, I mean, people have this uh, affinity for doing whatever they can naturally, and I won't wear out my expression yet again, but, um, you know, if they can they can stay natural, they would prefer that. And I understand that at, at a gut level, but if natural is not doing it for you, then why not, especially when it's such a night and day difference between natural and unnatural, why not go to the unnatural? And especially because uh, based upon all the information we have, you're doing yourself a favor, not only with what I would call the hedonistic as aspects of TRT, which is you feel better and you look better, but you will be medically, if you will, better. There's uh, fewer incidents of coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, prostate cancer, osteoporosis when using TRT. So it's just a win all the way around. So, you know, again, I think it's just a psychological issue that... I think people feel something that they shouldn't be doing. So they want to do it because they probably hear of all the benefits, but like, ah, I shouldn't be doing this. That's what well, that goes back to our generation. Where it <laughs> yeah. wasn't accepted like yeah. this, and, and guys yeah. were you know cheating when they yes. were using it in sport or, exactly. or otherwise, exactly. and, and so you know the times have changed so much, and we're yeah. not ignorant. Uh, it's better, no, it was but yeah, it might be uh, partly that that artifact. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I get it. Uh, but the, but but still, ask the question: mm -hmm. uh, Why is that a concern? You know, now for whatever your reasons, if yeah, I, I still want to go back to my natural, then um, you know a three month cycle. For whatever reasons you're doing it, uh, shouldn't shut off your own production. If it were, a, a, you know, a 10-year or arguably even a 30-year cycle, at some point it might not be within one month, like it would at 54, likely, and doing it for three months before your testosterone return, returns to what it would have been had you not done a cycle. Okay, at 30 years of doing this and coming off, it might take maybe even nine months to return to a level of endogenous production of testosterone that you would achieve had you not done replacement therapy for 30 years, but were then still, what, by that time, 84. Am I making that clear? So yeah. you'd have, eight, you know, don't forget, you're 84 now, 30 years later, so you'd have an 84-year-old's testosterone production. It would be whatever your natural production would be at 84, but like I say, it might take as much as say nine months to get back to that level because uh, you were on it for so long and you're an old geezer at that point, you know, 84, certainly relative to 54. So, <laughs> it, you know, using a smaller amount, uh, would that make a difference? No, it, it's not so much the dose you use. Uh, and I'm in no way backing what they call a, a, a blasting and cruising, you know, using really, I would almost say stupidly high dosages of, of, uh, of androgens or anabolic steroids, but that's not the issue so much as the chronicity of use. It's how long you're on it and, and at what age you're doing it, starting and until, that affects your endogenous production and it bouncing back, uh, I won't say or not, but how quickly it bounces back into what level. So it's, it's not about, uh, well, you know, am I safer to use, you know, say 200 a week instead of 250 a week? No, do what's the most appropriate dose it's all about the time that you're on it, not 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 otherwise. And I think that's I, I got all the questions. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's good. Thanks, Doc. All right, last one for this time, Doc. Last one for this week it says, uh, "Hey, Doc, thanks for the great work you are doing by putting true information out there." I know I speak for many when I say that. It is much appreciated. Well, Dave and I both say you're welcome. Yes, <laughs> uh, and it's a pleasure. My question is, aside from testosterone, which steroid would you say is the safest uh, one to use as a stack for bodybuilding, and which would you say is the least safe? I know only a few are legally obtainable here in the U.S., but let's assume they were all legal. He's watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> he says, laugh out loud. Thanks so much. 
uh, in advance for answering my question. He doesn't leave us a name, but um, I, boy, I, I didn't, for some reason I missed this one. Uh, I don't know if I can give you a complete list off the top of my head as to which are legal. I can tell you which ones make the most sense to consider, okay. which I think is really what he's asking, yeah. you know, and which are r- ridiculous. I believe, for example, it's easy to answer one part of this question. Uh, I, I believe halitestin, and I don't know the generic name for it off the top of my head, because why would I? I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, I think it's it's on uh, the, the, the formulary in the United States as legal. It's not contraband. No, no. Yeah, it's, but yeah. why would you want to use halitestin? Maybe there's a bodybuilding reason for it, that it does something super if someone's a They adventure. say it really dries you out the last two weeks before a show, really gets you hard. and I mean, that's... You know, so does doing your homework right. That's the like that's the word on the right? street. You know, they say certain things should be taken just for cutting, especially the last few weeks. It just dries you out and you know really gives okay. you that grainy condition. That's what that hardness. That's what that's the word on the street. In my well, opinion. from the research I've done, uh, it's also very very hard on the liver. Yes, and uh, it's it's also very hard on the psyche for a lot of people. It comes. Uh, it's one of those things where normally I would say. When, when people talk about, oh, he's, he's, he's on a roid rage. No, he's not. Typically, it's because he's not controlling his estrogen. I should say he or she, because estrogen doesn't do either gender any favors uh, when in excess. Um, so that moodiness and irascibility is usually uncontrolled estrogen. But the exception, yeah, one exception is with halitestin. I think it comes with a... a um, a, a signature, if you will, of, of you know more aggression, more moodiness, uh, as does oftentimes um, Anadrol, which is yes. also a legal. Yes. Uh, I've never prescribed Anadrol in my life. I can't think of a reason why I would, would need to. Uh, I know I've talked to other um, colleagues in this area, and um, I think I can, and well, I won't name a name, I don't know why, but... Uh, Maybe it's, he wants to keep it more more private, but uh, one physician has maybe prescribed it a half dozen times, according to him. Is it for anemia? Or what is it for? Well, it's for for I believe like pernicious anemia is one of the indications, but for really really difficult cases of cachexia or hard gainers, you know, where you just can't put on weight. Well, I've never run across that. I mean, usually it's something where uh, diet and exercise, if those fail, along with TRT. Uh, then you can use something which is much more gentler, meaning with fewer side effects. And that's the problem with Anadrol, real quick, is it, it, it doesn't convert to estrogen, but it converts to a substance that acts like estrogen, it seems like, and, and have those same side effects, moodiness or acidability. So for, for some people, anyway, it can it make you feel horrible. So why would you go there? Mm-hmm. If you can use something uh, anabolic like a, a legal steroid, uh, for example, Nandrolone, Lifesaver, literally lifesaver for someone with a wasting disorder like HIV. Um, uh, uh, same, uh, well, not the same, but uh, uh, oxandrolone, uh, which used to go as Anavar. Mm-hmm. Another very uh, safe anabolic steroid that you, you know you don't worry about these symptoms. First of all, it's a dihydrotestosterone derivative, so it won't convert to, to estrogen. Period. So you don't have that particular side effect. Uh, it's an oral though, so uh, if you if you're definitely trying to put on weight on someone, um, uh, nandrolone might be a better choice. Nandrolone technically a little bit of it can convert down the line to to some estrogens, but nothing really material. So again, another very safe one, and it's injectable, so you don't have to deal with that first pass on the liver. Uh, so uh, so so least safe, I would say halitestin for just its effect on the body. Halitestin for its effect on the mind, Anadrol for its effect on the mind, possibly. Some people don't react this way. The problem is when I say something like that, uh, because halitestin isn't, I don't see it prescribed, I don't see it in the marketplace, so to speak, uh, in the business. I don't have people coming in and saying, yeah, my other physician has me on halitestin, my other physician has me on Anadrol. Do we know? that that patient who says, oh, I'm taking halitestin, I don't have any side effects, is truly taking halitestin because it might be bootleg is what I'm getting, mm-hmm. you know, some, some obtained, you know, uh, in the black market. Because mm-hmm. again, I don't know any physicians who uh, who prescribe halitestin and, and uh, very few who even prescribe antidrol. Why does it exist in halitestin? 
these are things that I have no answers for because wow. it, you know I'd have to go back and, and do some research and it's, it's, it might be an interesting, interesting. dive yeah. to see when was it legalized when was it for made, what purpose yeah, yeah. Uh, available uh, by prescription and you know why was it left there mm-hmm. you know, there's all kinds of stories I, I mean I heard you know GHRP uh, two and six were taken off the market not last May 2020 but 2019 yeah. because of sort of a random check of a specific pharmacy. Uh, looking at something else, other you know, requirements of, you know, to, 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 it's part of regulation. Mm-hmm. And, oh, look, we saw this. Oh, well, you guys shouldn't be doing that. And, and GHRP, too, and so I'm making the story way too simple. Yeah. But it was taken off the market. Why that hasn't happened with halitestin because uh, there are cracks. other much better yeah. drugs. Yeah, I, I don't know, but it'd probably yeah. be an interesting dive and yeah. see what happened. But yeah, um, the, the more safe in general are injectable. And, and that's kind of a... I have to say that, but safety, you know, whether you take it orally or injectable, contrary to what we used to believe, when we were comparing an oral, like methylated testosterone, when the original oral dosages of testosterone was much different. It was methylated so that it would make it hard for the body to break down, therefore keep it around longer. But because it made it hard for the liver, it was considered not good for you. We have an oral testosterone now, an undecanoate, which I think requires three or four times a day dosing. So it's not on my list of preferred things just because of, I think compliance would be an issue, patient compliance or preference. But we don't worry about that anymore uh, in terms of its effect on liver, males or females, meaning males even a higher dose, because we realize it's, it's not like methylated tests. So that's kind of a, I'll call it an artifact of, of yesteryear. There's not that big a difference where you'd have to worry about it. You might have just as much of an effect or more by taking uh, a dose, a high dose of Tylenol than you would of, of you know, an oral, uh, like Oxandrol, an anabolic steroid. So uh, when I say safer, it's technically safer just because you miss that first pass on the liver when you don't ingest it and you just uh, inject it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, the other legally obtainable in the U.S. Uh, off the top of my head that I would ever deal with would be um, Stanazolol, which used to go by the brand name Winstrol. Yeah. Uh, I people, said, people prescribe that? That one's unique in that um, uh, one of the few occasions I ever considered that was for someone who had a kidney failure as well as cachexia and was uh, an older gentleman who didn't have the muscle mass, unfortunately, to even get up off the potty without assistance. Very proud man and, and his whole family. It's a long story, but you know, the, uh, it, it's, it's designed for angioedema, or one of the indications, I should say, is for angioedema. It's very similar. It's a dihydrotestosterone derivative. Uh, so it's very similar to oxandrolone, but it has this extra feature of what bodybuilders would call drying you out. Yeah. So it seemed like a good... Um, try because it would it would give two things it would help get rid of the excess water that he was accumulating because he had chronic kidney failure and some heart issues uh but also get you know some some meat on his bones again and some strength back um, it work i never um I, th- I think i actually got to write the prescription it was okay. never filled because unfortunately he passed away oh, but uh, it was just you know the idea of okay yeah. here he got something with an extra feature for angioedema yes. that would be a consideration but for someone else who's you know uh, 40 years old, 50 years old, you know, we, we tend to dry out as we get older. Uh, I think we're born about 70% water. And if we make it to uh, life expectancy today for males, about 79, we're about 50% water at that point. You oh, know, wow. we desiccate. So yeah. why do we want to dry out even more and risk, you know, tin damage? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it's, uh, I know bodybuilders look at it to help, again, uh, dry out instead of using uh, diuretics, which to me are, that's a whole other story. I think that's nuts. Uh, but um, anyway, um, uh, so I mentioned oxandrolone, stenazolol, uh, nandrolone, which used to be called decadorablin. Um, I mentioned anadrol, which again, I haven't had occasion to write for. Any other. Uh, what about Primo? Is that legal or not? Primo would be a great one. I don't know why we don't have that one legal here in the United States it's not? because it's a dihydrotestosterone derivative like the other two oxandrolone, stenazolol I mentioned. It's injectable though. And I've even mentioned this to the pharmacy, but whatever the regulations are, I don't remember what the rationale behind not uh, being approved for development and use in the United States. Why don't we do a suspension 
of of oxandrolone, or if it's possible, you know, something that's an oil based, uh, like primabolin, because again, it has the feature of being able to be injected, which again allows that first pass uh, of of the liver to be avoided. But primabolin um, would work similarly to anavar. It's just I don't I don't know why it's not available. I thought it was legal for some reason with what's prescription. Weird. Okay. Not here in the United States, to my knowledge. Okay. And there are probably more that are legal. I just don't know them because I don't yeah. have occasion to use them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the rest of them, okay, so ones I know are considered contraband here would be things like Danabol. Um, Equipoise. Equipoise, well, except for veterinary use. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the derivative of, um, uh, oh, gee whiz. It starts with an M, the, the guys. Uh, I know. Oh, yes. Anyway, they're, they're Masteron, the, Masteron, and and the other derivative that's even lighter than Masteron that they use sometimes. Those are all contraband in this country, yeah. and it doesn't mean that they're necessarily dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just means they haven't been studied and approved yeah. by the FDA here. So, well, I don't want to give you a thumbs up or thumbs down one way or the other yeah. because we don't have the studies here, and, yeah. and here we are in the U.S. But uh, you know, you can look at the structure, and and I think most of the risk you take if, uh, if something is not approved here is because if you are getting it here, more than likely it's been made in somebody's, you know, laboratory. So who knows what's in it? And it's not, uh, well, aside from the legal aspects, why do you want to get into trouble legally? But uh, if you're you're taking that risk, you're also taking possibly a medical risk because Mm -hmm. it's not done in a a proper environment in a pharmacy. But uh, I'm trying to think if there's any others. So uh, one of the ones that's popular these days is Trimbalone. Yeah, trend, yes. That's not legal here. No. And I don't think it ever was. It used to be uh, way back when Parabolin it was Parabolin. Parabolin. Yeah, 76 And it was a different, uh, yeah. it wasn't an acetate or an enanthate. It was a different form. starts with an H, I forget. Sorry, I'm not mm-hmm. having a good day with my with my words. Uh, but um, that one also came with a lot of side effects. But, uh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, typically with with uh, Trendblone, you have pretty serious night sweats. Mm, yes. Has a very strong affinity for the androgen receptor. Uh, I won't say it has side effects like um, like halitestin, but it can it can come with some aggressive tendencies. Yes. Again, everyone's different, but yeah. I, so I'm sort of generalizing. Definitely generalizing, not sort of. Yeah. But uh, maybe you have some other names that you can throw out there that you know. No, that's pretty much all. I what's out there? Of, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. so so most of them are considered legal and are considered contraband, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I say that just because I'd be great if we do some studies to make sure that you know we can vouch for safety of some of these versus not. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure there's there's a lot of things on the FDA's mind right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Good question. Thanks, Doc. Thank you.